Now, um, hmm. allow me to interrupt your comfort um, just a little bit before we continue. I see you're all scattered. I see you're all scattered. I see you're all mbali-mbali. Uh, Can you please stand up and just say hi to somebody that you did not come with? Show a smile, some teeth like this. God is good as best as teeth, so say hi to somebody. Yeah? Yeah, as in you are very few, you can stand and go around. Yes. It is a blessing to greet somebody. Eh? Oh, no, no, don't you make it. Huh? It's, it's, okay, it's okay, right? So you have put it on. <laughs> it's on. Ah, yes. So can I just say that you might be somebody who has made somebody's day. There are people here maybe they are not even greeted by anybody. And they have not been having such good mornings. And so sometimes it is good. You never know what your greeting does. Your hand might be very warm. And somebody may need warmth of heart. And you have done it. And so praise be to God for those who have obeyed. God is good. As we are all seated the way we want. This is a chain service where we are free. So continue as you are seated. I hope everybody can see me, right? Yes, it is good. I thank God because of uh, the people who are getting baptized as well. Um, I myself got baptized in this church, and I've seen many of them are young people. And for me, I am so encouraged to see young people coming to the Lord, getting through that relationship with him. It's not just a matter of, I'm saved from afar, but also through a marshal. You are dipped in water, and then when you come out... Um, Okay, you're not like a brand person. It's brand new person, in quotes, uh, because you don't change. You go inside joy, you come out joy, and it will be good to see uh, these friends of mine getting baptized, and God is good. Yeah, so, um, uh, what were you, ma? Yeah, those are my friends as well, what were you, ma? Ah, no, Everything, every time that things go wrong, everybody looks at the back. Yeah. What is happening to that uh, microphone? Hmm? All right. I can't see anything from the back, but it's okay. So you'll move like this, right? Yeah, I, I can't see. Uh, all right. So for those of you who have been visiting us for the first time, this is what we have been doing. This. We have been doing about eight deadly sins. And so recap is like that. So the first time we started, we started with Pastor Kit, who did about, who did and talked on, uh, okay, on the blue screen. Okay, on pride. Yeah? And then the second time we went was our Reverend Phoebe who talked about anger. And then we continued down to envy and then lying. And then last week, Engineer Albert Mogo talked about laziness or slothness or being a sloth. And so for me, I've been given the easiest task by Pastor Jose to speak about last. And I tell you the truth, when you know that it is very easy to when Pastor Jose, who gives you the topic with so much vigor and eagerness. Yes, speak about it. That's how he gave it to me. And I knew this is quite a good thing. And I thank God um, for me that I'm going to be speaking about um, the issue of lust. Move on, Mike. So now I cannot see this thing. So let me just get my notes from my phone. Just a minute. Ah, yes, this technology not good. So now I can see everything through my phone. Now, so I decided to do last. Before I started on it, I said to, to, to Google what is the meaning of last. What does it mean? And so those are the two definitions I came up with. They're defined like that. The first one is a very strong sexual desire. And the second one is a very powerful feeling of wanting something. A very strong. So one of them is sexual. The other one is is very a strong desire. For example, um, it's unfortunate that this is an example that I can use. It's, it's some of our leaders, not just African, but the whole leaders. They have that lust for power. As in, I'm going to get this power. No matter how many people I kill, I'm, going to, I'm lasting. As in, people want power because with power comes privileges, comes many things. And so that's actually a lust. And so the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And so the most amazing thing as I was doing this uh, research and I was doing this study is I saw and I noted that there are actually types of lust. Because number one is the lust of the flesh. And number two is the lust of the eyes. And then um, the, number three is the pride of life. But for me, I'm just dealing with lust. And I thought, oh my God, this, this, this lust is not just a one-off thing that we think about, oh, lasting. Like they just said, whoever uh, looks upon a woman has lasted, you know, there's a way you look at somebody. It's not only the sexual desire, but they're actually types of lust. And the lust of the flesh is temptation to feel physical pleasure from something, from <laughs> sinful activity. To do something to make the flesh feel satisfied. <laughs> Number one is obvious. Oh, yeah, I can see now. <laughs> so you can now move. Yes. So number one is masturbation. That's an example. And gossip. Amazingly, I found that gossip is the last of the flesh. Gossip. You know, you have this. Nikona kitu nataka kukuambia. choma. And most of the time, gossip is not. Gossip has never been something good. Yeah? I've never had somebody gossiping about something good in a way. It's always like a negative connotation to it. You might start. Unajua jose. Then you just, it dips from there. And then, drug use about the feeling of getting high, <laughs> you know, uh, smoking weed. You know, somebody came and told me, what if it is, what is it called, um, prescribed, <laughs> prescribed weed, prescribed marijuana, as in some of these uh, American states. I'm like, you know, as Paul says, everything is not bad, but not everything is beneficial, yeah? Even actually, by the way, it is recommended. If you listen to some doctors, as masturbation is good, it is, that's what they say. But for me, I tell somebody, now, this is the thing. If your smoking of weed <laughs> is like eating ugali, you know, like they eat ugali, don't eat ugali and they get high, I get satisfied. Yeah? If your smoking of marijuana has no condition of, mm, if it's something different, it's okay. If you're masturbating and thinking about your exams, your mother, ah, then you're good. But why are these things bad? It's because of the thought behind them. I'm going to do these things so that I want to get high. I'm going to do this because there's a certain pressure I want to relieve. You know? And then number two is the lust of the eyes. Temptation to cast our eyes upon something or some things with the desire or pleasure, even though God has told us not to look upon those things. It is the recognition that something sinful has visual appeal and then wanting it for the sake of its visual appeal. Sometimes you don't even need it. Yeah? For example, I've seen a Range Rover. My God, they look so beautiful. They have these nice calves. I, oh, hey, I want that. Yeah, maybe not, I don't need it because I'm still working and even my financial status cannot allow me to get that Range Rover. But because of the way it looks like, eh, it's good. Somebody says, eh, so and so has a beautiful wife. Nataka kama huyo. Ah, okay. My brother, we know when you are some of these things. Now, our reading today was in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11. It is a very long verse, but I can still read it because that's where we are basing it from. So, open the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11, Tafadali, not the back, that I can read. So this starts. In the spring... If you don't, you can continue with me. If you have not opened your Bible, you can read in the screen. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, is in this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to, her, to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. 
So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. When David was told uh, Uriah did not go home, he asked him, haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and, the Israel, uh, uh, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in the tents. And my master Joab and my Lord's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his own mat among the master servants. He did not go home. In the morning, <clears throat> David wrote a letter to Job and, and, and sent it with Uriah. In it, he, uh, the, uh, in it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he could be struck down and die. So while Job had uh, the city under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. Then uh, when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's, uh, in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah, the hated, I died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know? Didn't didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jeru, Jeru Basheth? <coughs> didn't a woman throw an upper milestone on him from the wall so that he died in in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this. Then say to him, also your servant Uriah the Hittite died. So you can continue reading uh, the whole chapter. Because my focus is still on last. So now, you have heard the story of, of David. You have heard the story and you have read from the Bible about what happened. And so allow me to, to bring to you some of the things that I found out to be good in this chapter. Now, David encounters temptation is the first one. So verses 2, it says, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. Hey, no. Hmm. I'm supposed to start from one, sorry. David stays home from the war against the Ammonites, sorry. So in verses 1, it says, it happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go to battle, that David sent Joab his servant with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Now, the remaining of Jerusalem is quite something, because that's where the beginning of the problems started. Now, when David is supposed to be fighting, actually it says in the spring, at the time when kings, kings go out to battle, David sent his servant up to go. He stayed home. Now, something amazing about um, this staying home thing and why it is important it's because if you read before, like at the, uh, the chapter, chapter 10, if you read what happened to David's soldiers, David, uh, 
when his soldiers were sent, Job, still his uh, servant was sent, and actually uh, Second Samuel chapter 10, if you read how they were actually went, when the Ammonite king died, and David sent word about his messengers to go and say sorry, and then the way they were ashamed, and so David sent out uh, an army. <laughs> actually, they say they were actually, uh, what is it called, uh, something in the nose. They actually such, David was so consumed because his men were ashamed. And so when the Ammonites had that, they brought in the Ara uh, Arameans to actually fight against the Israelites. And when David sent Joab to go and actually fight them, so there was a fight between David, but the fight between the Israelites and the Ammonites and the Ar um, Arameans. Yeah, that word is actually hard. Arameans, Arameans, Arameans. <laughs> and so when they went, and they actually saw, hey, these are the Israelites, they ran away. Because after they were beaten, I can see they were beaten. Then they went with the Arameans. But imagine when they went and they saw the Israelites had gone, they regrouped and came back to fight. So when David saw these guys have regrouped, and this is not of Israel, uh, actually to fight people, and then they regrouped. Israel finished and finished Kabisa. When they regrouped, David now went out with now his men in chapter 10, as you go down. And when David gathered and led the Israel for battle, victory was actually eventual. He actually defeated these guys. Now, they killed, they killed 700 charioteers, 40,000 full soldiers, and the killing of Shobath, the commander of the army, who is leading now um, the army. That is actually chapter, chapter 10. That's the previous chapter before 11. And so he is staying home. It's actually something very odd. Because with David leading he, the men, the Israelites, they always wished to win. But now he sent Joab and he stayed home. And I think for me that's when I wear the Jesus begin. I think even sometimes it might even look like a slothness of some kind. Eh? It was some more a sloth, eh? a laziness that, wait, you can do this. Eh? And for me I'm thinking if I am a king and I know that God is with me and I know that my going is actually this victory assured, I'll not stay at home. I'll go with my men. Because what I'm thinking in my head, this is total waste if, I'm, if my men are going to go. Yes, they're going to win, but sure victory is actually with me because God is with me. I'll be going all the time. So David stayed home. But the essence of it is he should have been in the battlefield with his men. Now, that's the beginning. That's the genesis of his last of eyes. No, so David stays at home. And now the wars are with the Amorites. The, the Ammonites, now they are fighting. Now in verses 2, it continues and says, now David encounters the temptation. It says, then, then, then it happened one evening that David rose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. David is a king. And so he's allowed to pace and to walk around in this night. I think maybe he was, he was unable to sleep. I think this is maybe one of the consequences of all going to battle. You're thinking, so what is happening? So you're unable to sleep. Or it might be something else. You never know. He was maybe insomniatic. He had insomnia, I don't know. But anyway, he walked on the roof. And so as he was on the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And this is the thing. David's sin was not in seeing Bathsheba. It was unlikely that as he was walking up the roof that he had expected to see or planned to see her. David's sin was in choosing to keep his eyes on an alluring image after the sight came before his eyes. That's where it starts. You see something? You linger on it. Mm. And this is the thing. You cannot satisfy the lust of the flesh because they are primarily rebellious assertion of self. They come out because of yourself. But Sheba's beauty made the sight tempting. But real strength of temptation often does not lie in the quality of the tempting object, but in the state of of heart and mind of the one being tempted. That's a very good quote I found nice. That the real strength of the temptation often does not lie in the quality of the tempting object, 
but in the state of heart and mind of the one being tempted. So now David has seen, oh, the woman bathing. And actually he says, he is very beautiful to behold. That's what he was doing. And so number three, already a seed has been planted. Eh? And now David makes it grow. He pursues the temptation and embraces it. And so David sent, in verses three, and inquired about the woman. And somebody said, is this not but Sheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And verse 4 said, Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and slept with her. So now David is sending, sent uh, and inquired, Who is this woman? David could have ended the temptation by leaving the scene at that time, even after entertaining the, uh, the temptation for a while. Instead, David put himself in a more tempting situation. Oh, he had seen, oh, Oh, that's beautiful, okay. It goes back and does the things and just forgets about that. But no, David is the man. Then David sends messengers and took her. In this, David went following through a lustful impulse. David ignored every warning and way of escape God has sent him. He acted on feelings and impulse instead of thinking. Now, when David asked who this woman was, this is the definition he was given. Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? So why is Eliam important? Eliam was one of David's mighty men. Second Samuel chapter 23, if you read from verses 8, the title from NIV says David's mighty men. Eliam was part of his mighty men. Not just Eliam, please. He is the wife of who? Uriah the Hittite. And Uriah, Uriah, or Uriah depending on where you come from, was actually part of the David's mighty men. He's actually written in Psalms, in, in 2 Samuel uh, uh, 23. And 2 Samuel 23, uh, from verse 8 going down, he's actually saying who David, David's mighty men were. And so Uriah actually is written as a man who was mighty. And actually you can read how he was asking the question, how can I go and stay in my house when Israel's army and the mighty men are actually camping outside? How can I go? That's what he asked the king. How can I go? So he didn't even used to go home. Even when he was drunk, he, he knew where his mat was. The most amazing thing about this mighty man. That's what actually qualifies. To some of us, a home will be a place to go. To some of the drunkards, the mutaro will be a place to go. But this man, remember, I have a mat. And he goes near where his men are. And so this is actually a warning. You know, you're told this woman is not only Oh, and actually by the way it goes on, he says, eh, eh, Eliam, Eliam's father was Ahithophel, who's actually a wise man. As in this lady is surrounded, the men in this lady's life are mighty men. Okay, but then David still pulls us out. Oh, eh? That's what I think for me is, the way God tells you, please, eh, don't touch this one. Because if you're told, now, the father is like this, the husband is like this, the grandfather was like this, and you know all these things because you're the king, but you still continue pursuing that. I think that's when now the window came. And when you know temptation has besieged a separate is common to man, and God is will open up a door for you. So this is actually David's door. You say, leave that story alone. Ah, no, David continues. And I think one of David's Achilles' heel was the story of women. You can actually find it even in his son, who had a thousand women at his disposal. 700 wives, 300 concubines. Yeah? It's, it's like an Achilles' heel. Last of the eyes. So the consequences or the results of David's actions were this, an unplanned pregnancy. Remember, the word came to David, I am pregnant. David tried so hard to force Uriah to go home that can be framed that this is your son. The murdered of a trusted friend. Uriah was actually David's friend. If he invited him to his courts, maybe because but he was a friend. Then you know the baby died. You know the story about that. His daughter raped by his son. One son murdered by another son. A civil law led by his sons. As in, from, from that action, going down, the Lord was displeased with David. Number one, you took somebody's wife. After warnings I gave you, number two, you slept with her. Number three, in that, you killed the husband. And it was so bad that where he put him, 
and, and for me, as I was reading that, you feel very sad for you, right? Because he was framed. People move away. You know, in a battle, you always need your brothers, you always need your sisters. But you can have this battle, people moved away from him. So he was all exposed. Nobody to help him. He was exposed. Just because of one thing, a man died. The mighty man of David, or the mighty man of, the, of Israel's army. And so, if you allow us, allow me to give you um, a conclusion about last. Because for us, as you're coming up with these um, studies of eight deadly sins, was not to point about the sins, was to point us back to God. Because these sins are their anger, pride, and all that. But it is not our focus is not on the sin. Our focus is on the giver of life. This is the things he hates. But then, these are the things that we can do. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verses 22, it says, Run as fast as you can from all the ambitions of lust of youth. And test her for all that is pure. Whatever builds up your faith and deepens your love must become your holy pursuit. And live in peace with those who worship our Lord Jesus with pure hearts. Let me tell you, the sin of the lust of the eyes can only This thing can be done by running away. And the Bible says you run. Other versions say flee. Flee. And I don't think fleeing is, you know, yeah, that is not fleeing. As you're admiring the thing. No, fleeing is you run away. If it was Sheng, take it, take it. Yeah? If this was a Sheng school, I tell you, mraya unatoka, take it, take it. If I could tell you, I'd say, umiona police ya mekam, if you're a young man. At night, Mona Karao, yes. Do you see how you run? Yes, that is the way. Last is like a cop. If you're a young man, and then you run away from the cops because you'll be still be caught with no apparent reason because you're a man. At least, ladies, sometimes this does not happen. Last thing of the flesh, you must run. Last thing of the eyes, last itself, you must run. Flee from it. You must. Joseph was a very great example. When Joseph was being confronted, by the wife of Potiphar. He didn't say, ah, where well, nee, nee. eh? He didn't just say, okay. He ran. That's even he left his coat behind. He did. And that's what you're being told to do. Number one, you must run. Flee, my brother. Flee, my sister. Okay, I don't know why a uh, scene of the eyes mostly affects men. Uh, it affects men most of the times. Eh? Uh, okay, ladies, I don't know, but I'm speaking from a man's perspective because I'm a dude. We always see a lot. You, you're seeing. It's like your eyes are seeing. And it's something that you can't even, even at least, sometimes even avoid. You just see, bang, and then you linger it. So you must flee. Now, Job is a very great example. And this is what Job said. Eh? Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Not to look lustfully at a girl. You see, so number one, I have fleed. But then you must make a covenant with your eyes. Or bring yourself to a meeting. My eyes. We shall not look at women lustfully. Yes. Mm -hmm. You shall not. But then number two, let me say. Because it is not by might. It is not by power. It is by, by spirit, says the Lord. It's important that now the Lord helps us in this issue of lust. Psalms 51. Psalms 51 is when now David was confronted by Prophet Nathan about this thing. And I loved uh, these Psalms about what David said. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Continue. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from all my sins. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I seen and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justify when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the innermost place. Cleanse me with high soap, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. 
I'll stop here as you continue. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That was David. David lasted. David did all these things. He muttered. But God said, he's a man after my own heart. If you've read Psalms 51, the whole of it, you will hear how open he was to God. And because that's what God wants. And it's, there's actually um, a verse in that that says, what God desires is a, con- a broken heart and a contrary spirit. Sacrifices he does not want. He wants you to be broken and contrite before him. God, this is what I have done. God, this is what I am doing. I come to you. And in 1 John 1, 9, God is very faithful. He says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us from all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what God says. And so after David had said all these things, God did that. Because he's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And when David rested, God actually says, this is a man after my own heart. Because after all that was said and done, last, David was actually broken before God. After Nathan came and and confronted him, David was broken before God. And God forgave him. And so for us, we might be going through things. We might be going through the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes. You're thinking, God, is there a way to come back? God is faithful. He has shown it in David's life. Yes, he killed a man. Maybe you have not even killed any person. He slept with somebody's wife. Maybe you have not. It's something small you've done. And so the devil is telling you all the time, God can. So take heart. Even in this time, as you're going through all these eight deadly sins, God is faithful and just. Why we are showing you these things is because we need to show you back, to direct you back to the Father. The world is telling us these things, we are showing you that there is no way, other way, to be happy. But it's in Jesus. And so may the Lord help us, even as you're going on in our businesses, to know that God created in me a clean heart and renew a righteous, contrary spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Actually, it's a song. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, but restore unto me the joy of their salvation. Because there is no sin that God cannot forgive. That's what you are saying. That's what you are declaring this morning. Whatever sin, the eight deadly of them, pride, whatever, all those, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we thank you this morning because it is indeed true that you are faithful and just. It is indeed God, you who says that David was a man after your own heart. And that when you read the things he did, God, sometimes you're perplexed. But then you read about your faithfulness and you know, truly God, it is not about David that it is about you. And so God, we want to come back to the throne. We want to come back to the heart of worship where it is all about you. Father, may you have mercy upon our hearts, upon our minds, upon our all. That God, even as you draw near to you, you shall draw near to us. That God, you shall remove those things in our lives that God are hindering us to praise and to worship you, those things that are removing the joy of your salvation in our lives. And for those of us who do not know you, God, may we have an encounter with you, that we may truly come to this point of saying, what is this joy of God that people are talking about, that we may encounter you, that they may encounter you and know truly the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. That there is liberty, there is victory, there is freedom, because you know that if we confess our sins, That God truly is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And indeed God will give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.